the story they tell about one of the monks staying with a John Cha one time during the rains retreat that half of the roof of his hut blew off. And a John Cha happened to be walking around the monastery one day and noticed that half of the roof had blown off. It was raining into the hut. The monk had made a practice of sleeping on the half of the hut that was still roofed. And John Chai asked him, why are you doing this? Why aren't you fixing your hut? The monk said, well, I'm trying to practice equanimity. And John Chai's response was, that's it's not the equanimity the Buddha taught. That's the equanimity of a water buffalo. Or what we in English would say is the equanimity of a cow. The point here is that the Buddha didn't teach us just to be passive about things or just to accept things. The basic concept of the path is the difference between skillful and unskillful, and there are times when simple equanimity is not skillful. The Buddha said you have to look at your mind and see what works. There are skillful and unskillful qualities in the mind. He says, and there are times when you practice according to your pleasure, and it leads to defilements arising in the mind. He said, that's when you have to practice with pain. Whether you want to or not, that's what you've got to do, because you've got to be very careful not to let greed, anger, and delusion overcome the mind. Those are things you cannot be equanimous about. And so you'll notice there are times that simply watching these things come into the mind will be enough to make them fade away. As John Lee once said, he says, they get, they get embarrassed if you really look at them intently. There are other times, though, when they won't go away, no matter how much you look at them, in which case you have to fight them off, when you have to be proactive in preventing them, or if they're already there, proactive in getting rid of them. And an important skill in the path is learning when to be just an observer and when to be more proactive. So again, this is the concept of skillful and unskillful, which is so basic to everything. So this is one of the reasons we work with the breath in both ways, both being proactive with the breath and then watching it, so as to get a sense of when is it skillful to manipulate the breath, vary the, the length of the breath, the depth of the breath, quality of the breath, when to move the breath energy around the body, and then when, when to have a sense of when to just simply sit there and watch the breath. Because simply to accept things as they are is basically to deny something else, which is that you have a power, the power to change the present. One of the skills we have to learn is exactly how much power we have at any particular time. When things are going well, how do you maintain them? What do you do in order to keep them going well? Because sometimes all you have to do is just keep watching, watching, watching. That's enough. Other times you have to interfere, but not interfere in the sense of cutting it off, but you have to help things along in order to keep them going well. You'll see this as you try to get the mind to settle down. It takes one set of skills to get the mind in place and then another set of skills to keep it there, learning which of the activities that you had to do in order to get the mind to settle down still need to be done, and which ones can be abandoned. You see this in the description of jhana. It requires directed thought and evaluation to get the mind into the first jhana. You have to keep reminding yourself to stay with the breath and evaluating the breath. What can you do to make it more comfortable? What can you do to maximize that sense of comfort and spread it through the body? And then there comes a point where you've done everything you can. And John Fuang's image was of a water jar. You finally got the jar full. The, breath, the body is full of breath energy from the top to the bottom, as much as you can fill it up. And then he says, no matter how much more water you put into it, it can't get any more full than that. 
So you have to get a sense of how much is full for your body, and then just stay there. Maintain that sense of fullness. That place, at that point, you can let go of the directed thought and evaluation. Just keep watch. And it's in learning how to read the mind in a state of, in the various levels of concentration, the various types of concentration you can get it in. That's when you learn how to read all the important things going on in the mind in terms of the, the aggregates, in terms of how you relate to pain, in terms of how you create suffering. All the elements are right there. But it's in learning how to bring the mind to a state of balanced concentration where you develop the sensitivity where you can see these things in action. Then you develop a sure sense of touch. When to let things simply be and when to move in, make changes. Once you develop that touch, sense of touch inside, you also begin to notice that you begin to get more sensitive outside, the way you deal with other people. As we're here in the monastery, our top priority has to be the meditation. But we're also living in a community here, got to deal with other people, learn how to keep things going smoothly. The question is how much do you really have to do in order to keep things going smoothly, and how much is excessive? And how much is detrimental? One important guide is just keep keeping tabs of your breath all the time. And when you notice that it a particular conversation or a particular interaction with somebody else is interfering with your ability to focus on the breath. You have to ask yourself, okay, should I continue with this or is it time to back off? And here the emphasis is on maintaining your state of mind. So back off when you, as soon as you can. If you notice that you've lost the breath or your breath is getting stirred up. What this means, of course, is keeping conversations to a minimum. And understanding other people when they want to keep their conversation to a minimum as well. And it's only when something really has to be hashed out. Okay, that's when you sit down and hash it out. And again, the question is, how do you know when? Well, you're trying to get more and more sensitive to this. Realize that this is a big issue as we live together. What things have to be hashed out and what things can be left aside. There are no simple-minded rules of thumb here. It's as with all aspects of the practice, is learning how to get that sense of touch. And in the course of developing it, you're going to make mistakes. But learn how to recognize them and then correct correct your course. That way when the come, time comes to get back with just you and the breath, there will be a lot fewer issues to sort through before you can settle down. So be alert to the fact that you're never totally passive. There's always some activity going on, Whether, if it's, even if it's just the activity of being the watcher. Equanimity is a kind of action. It's an intention in the mind. But realize that you have a whole range of things that you can do to the present moment, and do your best to carry your intention to stay with the breath with you at all times, even when you leave the monastery and have a sense of the body. At times when you can't be fully aware of the ins and outs of the breath, at least have a sense of the presence of your body, where your feet are, where your hands are, and try to keep a 
sense of relaxation in the body. If you notice this tension, just allow it to dissipate, breathe through it. Someone may say that that's just too much to do at any one time, focusing on the breath and dealing with other situations. Well, you find your mind often takes on several activities all at once. And a lot of those extraneous activities are just that, extraneous. You're supposed to be working on one thing, but your mind is thinking about something else, totally unrelated. Well, take that part of your mind and put it to work on the breath. And remember that there's one way of resting, aside from just simply going to sleep, is finding work that's restful. Many times that's much better for you than just going off to sleep. So work with the breath in a way that's restful or invigorating or whatever you need at that particular time. Your skill as a meditator depends on having that sense of touch. Learning what you have to accept and what you don't have to accept. Accepting not only things as they are, but also accepting the fact that you have the potential to improve things when they're not really up to standard. When the Buddha talks about contentment, he says being content about your food, your clothing, your shelter, and medicine, but not being content to let unskillful states take over the mind. Those, he said, says you have to try to get rid of as quickly as possible. As if your hair, hair were on fire, or you had a turban, your hat, and your hat, your turban was on fire. Put it out as quickly as possible. So that the equanimity you develop is the equanimity of a Buddha, not the equanimity of a cow. In other words, your equanimity is skillfully applied. Then you carry around as your main category or your main thought in the back of your mind is this question of skill and lack of skill. What's skillful to say? What's skillful to do? What's skillful to think right now? And what's not? That pair, that duality, is extremely important. Without it, the path doesn't make sense, doesn't work. With it, you can turn any experience, any moment, into part of your practice of the path. So always keep it firmly in mind.